Hey everybody, uh, we are at the top of the hour here and so it's really exciting to be able to uh, talk with this community, although I really, uh, you know, miss the yellow house here. Uh, it always is such an exciting experience to be able to, you know, hang out, shoot the shit and like get into these issues in a, in a real um a real way. Uh, I feel quite a bit of distance from my communities of researchers and uh, because of the pandemic, um, but luckily I've been able to work with uh, an incredible team at Shorenstein with a little bit of crossover at Berkman uh, in order to sort of sustain my, my intellectual life. Um, and one of the things that we've been spending, I would say the last two years on uh, my life, but different folks have, have been engaged with it for different amounts of time um, is this media manipulation casebook. And what we're really trying to do is present a theory methods package for studying media manipulation and disinformation campaigns. And um, over the last several years, I've been really engaged in this specific topic because ultimately um, I think the question of media manipulation and disinformation for me really is about, do we have a right to the truth? Do we have a right to accurate information? And as we've watched the last, you know, probably two decades of um, technology develop, we've seen the uh, foreclosure of some of our other trusted institutions where we've seen, you know, the drying up of local journalism. We've seen uh, universities come to rely on Google services um, for most of their infrastructure. We've started to see social media kind of take hold of the public imagination. And none of these things are really thinking a lot uh, none of these things are really designed, I should say, to deal with what we're going through in this moment, which is profound isolation coupled with immense uh, and warranted paranoia about our political system, uh, an economic collapse. Uh, and, you know, I spend a lot of time in, in my room, just like the rest of you, trying to figure out some of these these big questions. And so today I really wanna talk about, well, what is the price that we're really paying for unchecked misinformation about the way in which our media ecosystem, to use um, a, a turn of phrase from, from Berkman Klein's illustrious history, uh, what, are we, what are we doing here with this media ecosystem in the midst of a pandemic, knowing that uh, the cost is very high if people get medical misinformation before they get access to timely, local, relevant, and accurate information. I'm gonna share my screen, got some really great graphics um, that we developed for the Media Manipulation Casebook at mediamanipulation.org. Uh, and these were developed by Jeb Riley, um, which is, he's an, an amazing illustrator and he's been helping with our team um, over the past few months sort of get our our stuff together. Um, so this is who I am. I am right now the research director and the director of the Technology and Social Change Project at the Shorenstein Center. Um, but apparently the Shorenstein Center is just like my house at this point. <laughs> it's really hard to think about like what, what a return to the university is gonna feel like given the fact that we've spent uh, several months uh, working from home, but um, Today, I'm going to present on the true cost of misinformation, producing moral and technical order in a time of pandemonium. And I choose that word really intentionally, and I'll, I'll tell you why. But first, a few key definitions. So what am I talking about when we're talking about media manipulation and disinformation online? We're talking about basic comms 101. Media is an artifact of communication. So, you know, notes and uh, books and, you know, any kind of thing memes, what have you, artifacts, things that are the leave behinds of uh, public conversation for the most part is what we study. But when I talk about news or news outlets, I will talk about news and news outlets uh, using that terminology. Uh, but when I say media, I'm referring in a way to this kind of ephemera. 
manipulation. My team has <laughs> debated quite a bit. And uh, if Gabby Lim is listening, she's she's been at the forefront of us trying to get our definitions in order. Um, manipulation to us is to change by artful or unfair means so as to serve one's purpose. And we leave the term artful in there because uh, as I was doing a history of uh, media manipulation on the web. I was drawn into the work of uh, the yes men who are media activists um, <clears throat> who really, uh, you know, figured out early on that, you know, who can own a domain? And apparently anybody can't because they uh, bought the domain associated with the WTO. They bought a domain associated with George Bush. And instead of, um, really lambasting these these groups, what they did was they impersonated them in order to draw in other folks. And there's been several documentaries made about the Yes Men and in their media manipulation hoaxes. But for them, the point isn't to keep the hoax going. The point is to reveal something about the nature of power. And so manipulation in that case, uh, for me, is, is a sort of an artful hack. Um, and we can talk a bit about white hat hacking and gray hacking if, if, if time allows. But when we talk about something as disinformation, we actually try to apply a very strict uh, set of criteria and, and we define it as the creation and distribution of intentionally false information for political ends. And intentionality, uh, you know, for anybody on the on the line here that is a lawyer you are just cringing right now I can can kind of feel it through the webinar um, and don't worry I'm not going to talk about the freeze peach that just you know sets your hair on fire but intention is hard I'm not gonna lie who can know a man's heart right uh, but the issue here about intentionality usually with disinformation campaigns if they are to set off a um, cascade of misinformation, uh, manipulating algorithms in particular, generally these groups have to recruit from more open spaces online. And so um, we've seen, you know, different for, you know, Reddit groups, for instance, be repurposed to uh, talk about the intention of what it means to spread disinformation and how to get one over on uh, certain journalists. And so we are able to discover intention when we can discover where a media manipulation campaign is being planned. Um, and so it's, but it's a really hard thing to assess without direct evidence. Um, but nevertheless, when we talk about disinformation, it's because we have some direct evidence that points us to the intention of the campaign. So I want to recognize that we're in a moment of extreme uh, emotional deprivation, you know, social isolation uh, in, in this word, the pandemic is something that I was really drawn to thinking about it in its um, it's entomology of thinking about of all the people, public, common, of disease, widespread. So pan and demos together, um, thinking about those kind of ills that, that spread in these kinds of situations that are, um, in some respects, completely uh, unpredictable and, and hopefully, at least for my lifetime, once in a lifetime. Um, but I prefer to call this moment pandemonium, and I'll tell you why. So pan meaning all, but also, um, I mean, demos meaning all, but pan meaning evil spirit, evil uh, divine power, inferior divine being. Um, and the reason why pandemonium for me uh, is a better descriptor of this moment is I think back to the right at the beginning when most people were like, okay, we can handle this. We'll get through this. This isn't going to be a problem. We're just going to, you know what? Everybody go home from school. We're just going to get on Zoom. And it created quite a, 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 quite, quite a chaotic environment. Um, when we were thinking about how do we write about the phenomenon of Zoom bombing, uh, my co-authors, Brian and Gabrielle Lim, Brian Freeberg and Gabrielle Lim, we were talking a lot about, well, where does this opportunity arise from where you have a bunch of people adopting a brand new technology very quickly. You have institutions buying into it at massive volume. And then you have students who are not really bought into wanting to be on Zoom all day. 
And so some of the early instances of Zoom bombing that we saw were not what it ended up being, which uh, turned into a, a kind of uh, political, political ideological war of racism and all kinds of other phobias. But at the beginning, it was a lot of pranking, uh, students dropping links to their classes into uh, chat apps saying, hey, you know, we're going to be talking about this thing, like, why don't you come in, pretend to be a student. And students were using their phones to videotape themselves invading classrooms and then uploading them to YouTube. And, and it was it was pretty funny. I'm not going to lie. My favorite one was this video of a, a student um, just interrupting the professor and saying, hey, can I just can I just pay you for an A? My other professors are letting me pay them. I'll give you three grand. We'll call it a day. And the professor's just like, what is going on? Are you even in this class? Right. Um, and it's just kind of jokey and hoaxy. And but it was a way of people coping with uh, the kind of moment trying to assess what was going on. And then you saw um, more vicious use cases of Zoom bombing where um, Black women, Black women professors were being targeted. You had instances where LGBT groups were being targeted, Alcoholics Anonymous. And it went from being pranking and hoaxing into something much more, um, well, the only word I can describe is disgusting. And what it prompted, though, was a rapid change in the technology itself. Zoom didn't just change their uh, settings but they really had to interrogate the entire system, even thinking through where their servers are based and what kind of privacy protections they would need to put into place. But what's interesting about that is because Zoom had uh, a closed business to business model and it wasn't necessarily like social media is just out in the world for all to use, uh, they were able to install these changes without um, an immense amount of uh, blowback uh, from the public. But when we see social media companies try to deal with some of the more uh, ter terrible use cases, uh, racist use cases, uh, transphobic use cases, things grind to a halt. Uh, and we've seen over the course of this uh, last summer, even instances where uh, social media is trying to clean up medical misinformation uh, in order to prevent, you know, poisoning, uh, as well as uh, people taking un un unnecessary risks. Uh, there's been pushback against that as well. And so it really has a lot to do with who the customers are and who the, you know, who the technology company thinks they're serving in terms of how they envision what is possible for the design of their systems. And in moments of pandemonium, or as Foucault might call epistemological ruptures or, uh, you know, paradigm shift, we see technology become much more flexible and malleable to the situation than uh, they may have been in other um, situations that didn't feel as, um, as, as, uh, as critical as they do right now. And so what you're living through in this moment is, is a really rapid su succession of technological changes that many of us are just, you know, every day waking up to and being like, wait, what happened? They did what? Didn't they say they were going to do this other thing? Uh, you know, and so um, as we as a research team try to reckon with this, we also have to think about, well, like methodologically, how do we capture this? And, and stylistically, theoretically, how do, we, how do we know what to look for? And so I always turn back to the work of Chris Kelty, uh, who was um, uh, my, my postdoc supervisor and someone who I, is an anthropologist and information studies scholar at UCLA. Uh, and he wrote this book, uh, 2009, called Two Bits. Um, and it's really, you know, also is indebted to the work of Eleanor Ostrom on governing the, the commons. But he talks a lot about how to produce moral and technical order. And he is studying um, free software. And so thinking with his, his framework, I, I'm really drawn in by this quote. 
Geeks fashion together both technology and principally software, hardware, networks, and protocols. An imagination of the proper order of collective, political, and commercial action. That is of how economy and society should be ordered collectively. And what he's really trying to say here is that the, the way in which our technology is built encodes a vision of society and the economy. And in building software in this way, we end up recursively with um, a society that in some ways mirrors that technology, but in other ways, the technology really is distorted by the conditions of its production. And so thinking through that, I was uh, wrote this paper with Anthony Needler, Matt Crane about weaponizing the digital influence machine, the political perils of online ad tech. Uh, this is like a year and a half ago or so. And we came up with this concept of the digital influence machine, which is the infrastructure of data collection and targeting capacities developed by ad platforms, web publishers, and other intermediaries, which includes consumer monitoring, audience targeting, and automated technologies that enhance its reach and ultimately its power to influence. And so instead of thinking about just social media, we're thinking about the architecture of advertising that spreads across the web and social media as a way to understand, well, how is the web or the internet reflecting back then its vision of society? And how is that infrastructure specifically about the reciprocity between data collection and then circulation of information through targeting? Um, how is that encoded and, and what forms of power are then able to leverage that digital influence machine in order to produce, let's just call it social change. Um, but that power is something that uh, sociologists, comm scholars, every one of us, uh, I think on this webinar today are really interested in understanding because I'm not making the case that every instance of misuse of technology is the fault of some company. What we're actually trying to understand is as this technology scales, as it develops, what kind of social imagination is animating design decisions? And who can either purchase power in this system or wield it by, by virtue of having um, very, very large social networks. Uh, and so we're not necessarily interested in all misinformation or all instances of bad behavior online. What we're interested in is how do certain kinds of behaviors scale? How do people learn about it? How do they adopt that kind of um, uh, power? And how do they wield it uh, against a society that is uh using the internet by and large for uh entertainment uh using it to learn about things using it to uh read the news using it for their education right a lot of things are now passing through the internet as a kind of obligatory passage point but in doing so in in digitizing most of our lives and now even most of our everyday lives during the pandemic, what kind of different differences in power are manifesting themselves um, and to what ends then are we as a collective asked to um, shoulder the burden or to, to pay the price for um, the production of this particular kind of moral and technical order? So I ask myself, if we're in this situation and it's um, now, I would say easier than ever to conduct propaganda campaigns, to um, hoax the public, to perform different kinds of grifts. Uh, I'm drawn into thinking about how 
at the beginning of the pandemic, there were nearly a hundred, there were over a hundred thousand new domains registered with COVID-19 or coronavirus as uh, part of the, the, the domain address, uh, part of the URL. So what ways in which are we paying for this kind of media ecosystem information environment that uh, ultimately doesn't seem to be serving our broadest public interest, which for me is at this stage, at least with the, the, with the pandemic, uh, being able to access accurate information. So I'm thinking a bit about uh, through the lens of um, Siva Vardagathian's book on uh, anti-social media, thinking about, well, who pays for social media? You know, the adage, of course, is if the product is free, the product is you. Um, but the product actually isn't free. Uh, advertisers are the ones that, that pay for it. And then you are the, the uh, consumer of advertising through social media. But Zuckerberg said this really interesting thing. He said, I don't think it's right for a private company to censor politicians in a democracy. So this is during his Georgetown uh, speech. And I thought, yeah, I can agree with that. And like private companies shouldn't be censoring politicians in a democracy. Cool. But also like this seems really like a platitude. It doesn't seem um, it doesn't it. it, it it resonates, but it doesn't, it just hits different when you start to think about, well, what does they mean by censoring politicians? And what do you do when you create the conditions by which politicians can, um, or any old, any old person can speak to millions at scale? Um, what happens when you are not necessarily um, accounting for the fact that you have built a broadcast technology that is allowing for misinformation at scale. And so that was my, my initial thoughts on this. And, and one of the things that I was drawn into in early January, 2020, was a bit of a reversal in Facebook policy where they write, in the absence of regulation, Facebook and other companies are left to design their own policies. We have based ours on the principle that people should be able to hear from those who wish to lead them, warts and all. And that, kind of statement, warts and all, made me wonder a bit about, well, how are they really going to reckon with the way in which um, different politicians are using their system, not just uh, the organic, quote unquote, we could get into all kinds of metaphors about why that's, why that, get into all discussion about why that metaphor is wrong. But what is it that they're actually trying to get at uh, when they say warts and all? when it comes to politicians who are using both their advertising systems and other forms of social media marketing to uh, essentially delude the public, right? To, to not just put forward a political position, but also to um, gin up all kinds of suspicion. And, um, and of course, this is before the pandemic really takes root. But, um, you know, this seemed to be their reaction, uh, Facebook's reaction to the situation that we were in was basically like, well, if you don't regulate us, we're just going to, you know, kind of have to let it happen. And then the pandemic hits and Facebook realizes that they become this central figure in um, not only medical misinformation campaigns, but also in this um, effort to, as uh, Yokai Benkler and Rob Ferris's uh, group have, have shown, uh, to make people believe that mail-in voting is uh, uh, insanely corrupt. And so eventually Facebook does have to change their policies on political advertising because they realize that at scale, it's different. Scale is different. Uh, you know, uh, Clay Shirky often talks about more is different, right? And in sociology, we don't understand ourselves as psychologists because we know that more is different. Society is actually different. And so when you're dealing with um, misinformation at scale, people who pay the price don't tend to be the companies at all, but really end up being... Um, the people who are information consum consumers, let's say. 
So how do we study this? How do we study misinformation at scale? How do we make sense of it? Uh, our new website is up now. Um, and what we do is we put together a theory about the media manipulation life cycle, which if you want to study these things, we recommend that you look for essentially five points of action. Where is the manipulation campaign being planned? What are its origins? How does it spread across social platforms in the web? What are the responses by industry activists, politicians, and journalists? This is crucial. If nobody responds to your misinformation campaign, not much happens. Um, you know, 2016, 2017, um, even earlier than that, Whitney Phillips's work has pointed us to the fact that this kind of media hoaxing uh, performed by, you know, trolls and, and other um, folks through 4chan, it, it had become a bit of a game to try to get journalists to say the wrong thing, to try to get politicians or other folks to chime in, uh, to quote unquote, trigger the libs. Uh, and so when we're thinking about like how a media manipulation campaign is going to succeed, we're actually trying to understand, well, who's going to respond? Uh, because, you know, there's going to be so many uh, let's just call them shenanigans online, that um, it would be impossible to moderate that at scale. Then we look very closely at mitigations. So 2016, 2017, really the big tools of social media companies were content moderation, including takedowns and the removal of certain accounts. Um, they weren't really in the business 2016, 2017 of de de uh, demoting content. There was some uh, removal of monetization. But over the last year in particular, we've seen uh, a number of different ways in which platform companies are willing to do uh, moderation uh, and curation of content online. And so stage four is, has expanded. But without any transparency. <laughs> and so we're often backing into uh, problems of uh, content moderation as we're trying to uh, understand the scale and the scope of a, a media manipulation campaign. We often run into uh, moderation that has not um, been recorded in any public kind of way. And then the last thing we look at is the adjustments by the manipulators to the new information environment. So if some action is taken or if they enjoy some success, we will see that campaign happen again and again and again. Um, so if we can answer the question around, you know, who pays for social media and we know that advertisers are pumping money into it and we know that, uh, you know, the public is by and large the uh, crop that is being that is being harvested, um, we have to think about this category of misinformation then a little bit differently. We have to think about, well, who is actually called into service to mitigate misinformation at scale? Uh, I won't make you suffer through the, um, the open hearing that I was part of, but it is on YouTube. Not ironically, that is where they air uh, the Select Committee on Intelligence hearings. Um, and we did a hearing on misinformation, conspiracy theories, and infodemics. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, what I presented in that hearing and then how I think about it related to the media manipulation casebook. So uh, when we're thinking about who pays for misinformation, I'm really thinking about se uh, several categories of folks that are professionals that have now started to build their livelihoods and careers around handling misinformation at scale. So journalists, we know the story. Uh, many of us are probably involved in this where uh, our role is one of uh, finding um, misinformation online or disinformation campaigns and then ringing the alarm bell and um, trying to get platform companies to go on record. This is a new beat for journalists. Uh, with the last several years, journalists have really honed skills that are unlike any other using open source intelligence, uh, as well as using other forms of, um, of online investigation, even digital ethnography to get to the bottom of misinformation campaigns. Public health professionals, uh, I talk to more public health professionals than 
I have uh, in the span of my lifetime over the last few months where they are just deluged by the kinds of uh, by people who are scared, people who are confused and people who want to know more about uh, COVID-19 because they saw online you know, that uh, 5G is causing coronavirus, therefore no vaccine will work. Uh, they saw online that Bill Gates actually unleashed this on the world. And so we just need to put Bill Gates in jail and the rest of this will end, right? Public health professionals have been called in to do uh, quite a bit of, of misinformation wrangling. Civil society leaders, uh, I've been working with a group of folks uh, through the Disinformation Defense League for the past several months, uh, really focused on get out the vote campaigns, right? If your get out the vote campaign isn't just about, you know, letting people know when, where and how to vote, but really about trying to get them to understand that uh, voting is not uh, imperiled, your mail-in voting is not imperiled. Uh, or other forms of voting, or that the, the machines aren't rigged. This is the role that civil society has had to take on as a result of misinformation at scale. And then lastly, law enforcement, public service, uh, election officials, uh, probably best exemplified by the, uh, the recent uh, controversy around um, the website operated by CISA, which Chris Krebs was at the helm of until uh, he was fired via Twitter. Um, you know, these are the kinds of folks that are taking these questions, fielding these questions about voter fraud and misinformation. And so they don't have budgets for that. Nobody was like, oh, yeah, you know what, we also need to have a huge misinformation budget so that election officials can let people know that their votes were counted and that this is the, the way in which um, the machines that they used worked or this is how we verified uh, signatures. Right, we just, it, it, I anticipated it, but for the most part, we didn't anticipate the scale at which this would be occurring. And so when we talk about this on our website and I, we have 14 or so case studies up there, we have about another nine or so that's gonna go up by end of year. Uh, one case in particular around the Ukraine whistleblower, um, we were looking at the different kinds of media manipulation tactics that were used and journalists by and large had to really navigate a very twisted terrain of trying to cover um, uh, the Ukraine story without saying the name of the whistleblower, which was traveling uh, in very high volumes throughout the right-wing media ecosystem. And there were a lot of attempts to try to get center and left media um, to say this person's name. Uh, and for the most part, they relented and they didn't cover the disinformation campaign because of the role and the status that whistleblowers historically play in our society, which is that we should be protecting their anonymity. As well, uh, the pandemic documentary, the way that that was planted online, they knew it was going to violate the terms of service on every platform. So they set up a website in which you could um, engage with the content, watch the content, but then also download it. And they had a set of instructions that basically said, download this and re-upload it to your own social media. And this happened thousands and thousands of times. So it was really difficult to actually get that video removed from the internet um, and removed from, let's say, prominent platforms because it's still on, on the internet. But this tactic of distributed amplification, we've seen this before, but we still don't have a lot of great solutions to it uh, when it comes to dealing with medical misinformation in particular. As well, when we're thinking about viral slogans and the ways in which civil society have had to deal with uh, white supremacists and extremist speech online, uh, we have a case study about the slogan, it's okay to be white and the way that it moved from uh, flyers that were planted on college campuses with a very plain message. There was no indication of who was doing this other than if you needed to look, uh, if you knew where to look on 4chan, you knew that it was a campaign by uh, white supremacists and trolls that basically asked people to put this flyer up 
in public places that just says it's okay to be white. In Massachusetts, someone actually put up a banner over the highway uh, trying to get media and other folks to take pictures of it. And this kind of viral sloganeering is something that um, civil society organizations have really had to reckon with and uh, call attention to so that people understand every iterance of this uh, slogan uh, is meant to create the conditions by which people would discuss racism and race, but through the lens of whiteness and, and to try to normalize discourse about white identity. And then public services, uh, one of the case studies that we have up there is a case study about a Maxine Waters forged letter. The letter looks as if, I mean, there's a lot of um, digital forensics that make you, you know, realize very quickly that this is a, a forgery. But it was a letter saying that it was a letter written for Maxine Waters, quote unquote, to a bank, basically saying, if you bring these people uh, if you if you donate a million dollars to me, I will bring. Um, I think that was the figure was like thirty eight thousand immigrants who are all going to need mortgages to uh, this area. And so if you if I win, then we all win, kind of thing. And this letter was planted by her um, opponent, and then through the uses of uh, bots and other kinds of automated technologies, was promoted uh, online. But it actually ended up with uh, the FBI having to get involved. And we've seen numerous instances now, especially during the pandemic, where law enforcement are now being called up with these rumors and, and they're being asked, you know, will you uh, step in and deal with, you know, Antifa setting fires in my neighborhood? And law enforcement are like, where is this coming from? Like, why now are we being asked to deal with misinformation at scale and these kinds of rumors. And so, uh, and of course, election officials, as I mentioned earlier, are also being called into the fray. So what does it all mean? Um, I wrote in MIT Tech uh, October 5th of this year of, it's still this year, yeah, it's December 1st, rabbit, rabbit. Um, I wrote this piece on, called Thank You for Posting. And I, I make this argument like secondhand smoke, misinformation damages the quality of public life. Every conspiracy theory, every propaganda or disinformation campaign affects people, and the expense of not responding can grow exponentially over time. Since the 2016 U.S. election, newsrooms, technology companies, civil society organizations, politicians, educators, and researchers have been working to quarantine the viral spread of misinformation. The true costs have been passed on to them and to everyday folks who rely on social media to get news and information. So if we were to try to restore moral and technical order, I got like a list, I got lists all over the place of things that I think we could do, but I'd love to discuss some of these with you. Um, I think we need a really good plan for content creation coupled with transparency and content moderation. I've argued in the past for hiring 10,000 librarians to help Google and Facebook and Twitter um, sort out the curation problem so that when people are looking for accurate information and they're not looking for opinion, uh, they can find it. You know, if you think about Google search results, the things that become popular are the things that are free. Anything that's behind a paywall uh, is not something that people are going to continue to return to. And so as a result, Google search becomes um, the kind of, you know, the kind of quality of a, of a free bin outside of a record store, right? Uh, every once in a while, there's a gem at the top, but not, not usually. Um, we also need a distribution plan for the truth that supports public media. And social media companies must deliver timely, local, relevant, and accurate information. We've seen this happen with pandemic misinformation, um, information where there's lots of these like yellow banners that are showing up on websites. Uh, that's not a plan. That's like a sticky note. <laughs> so we need, we need something else. Uh, we need to develop a policy on strategic amplification that mirrors the public interest obligations of other broadcast companies. When we think about strategic amplification, if something is reaching 50,000 people, when we think about broadcast and radio, we have rules for that. So when, when something is reaching a certain amount of views or a certain amount of clicks or a certain amount of people, 
um, routinely, especially if it's a certain influencer, there has to be some kind of measure that will help us understand when misinformation or hate speech or incitement to violence is circulating it at epic volumes. How, what is the protocol that should exist across uh, social media sites? And then lastly, I think um, something that fell out of view but is still very important is that technology companies, including large infrastructure services, must fund independent civil rights audits where auditors are able to access the data needed to perform investigations, including a record of decisions to remove, monetize, or amplify content. And so we need much more transparency, and this might even come in the form of a um, agency that can deal with this. So these are just four of the ideas that I've come up with off the top of my head, wrote on the back of a napkin and didn't give much thought to. Um, I'm kidding. I've, I spend my whole life seeped in this nonsense. Um, and the only thing that sustains me through it, I think, is knowing that there are people like the good folks at Berkman Klein that want to deal with these problems um, and want to deal with them responsibly, uh, but also understand that these are problems that harm uh, different groups of people disproportionately. And we've got a really great um, white paper up on mediamanipulation.org from Brandy Collins Dexter, specifically about how COVID-19 misinformation manifests in, in Black communities online. And so as we deal with the pandemic, as we deal with uh, the questions of moral and technical order, we're really just striving to answer, do we have a right to the truth? And if so, how do we get there? Right? And so that's the thing that's been pain, my pain for, for many, many years now. But um, I'm hoping that through, you know, the next several years of a, an administration that is uh, potentially, I don't know, I don't even know, sympathetic to dealing with um, harassment of women, um, the ways in which uh, certain communities are underserved online, uh, particularly Black communities, dealing with the, the kinds of meta misinformation that are uh, pervading um, Latino communities as well, uh, that we will get somewhere on some of these issues, um, but it's going to be a very, very long process. So I just want to thank my team and the folks that help me think through these problems every day. Uh, and we are now open for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joan. Uh, so we definitely have a bunch of questions coming in and we'll start with some of the ones that are getting some additional thumbs up just as uh, uh, those seem to be the most compelling from, from people. Um, so one is, is from Madeline Miller and uh, states, as a student currently as a student currently doing a professional degree in library and information science, what can I do about be part of a team of 10,000 libraries working on community misinformation? Yeah, I think like, you know, I would love for, you know, the ALA to step in and, and really create a, a program that allows for, you know, at conferences for this kind of thing to develop. Um, as well, you know, there have been different efforts to build a digital public library, but I do think that we need um, more librarians' voices uh, embedded in industry. Uh, and it pains me to say that because ideally, as uh, the utopian that I am, we would build a broad public infrastructure that deals with these problems. And I'm like very excited for Ethan Zuckerman's new lab um, at UMass to deal with some of these issues. But for now, we have what we have. <laughs> and we do need folks to start to think about, well, if we were going to take, you know, let's say 20 consistent disinformation trends and deal with them specifically, how would we reformat search so that the first three to five things that people see are actually things that have been vetted? Francesca Tripodi has this really great report at Data and Society on searching for alternative facts. And one of the things that she discovered in her, uh, you know, ethnography was that a lot of people believe that the thing that they see first on Google, it has been fact-checked in some way. 
and or vetted in some way or is the truest thing and it's not and so um i think there's a lot of work to be done by librarians to sort out our information ecosystem um and to make good models for how we would advance um a knowledge-based infrastructure rather than uh, a popularity or pay-to-play infrastructure, which is what we have now. All right, thank you. Um, so this is one that, that came up early and um, I think it's a, it's a question that is often comes up in this realm. And this is how do you, like how does your definition of disinformation differ from propaganda? And I might add to that, you know, how is this challenging given that, that those are probably, for lack of a better word, unstable categories with many of the different entities that, that we're looking at here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, the reason why disinformation is actually an interesting category to work with is because it shows up in, you know, American discourse prior to 2016 is something that is sort of uniquely Russian in the sense that these are kinds of campaigns that are associated with Russian political uh, tactics, information warfare. Um, but as the U.S. starts to figure out that there's disinformation happening, uh, you get this discourse of fake news uh, and um, you know, Claire Wardle did a lot of work to try to tell people not to use that word because it was playing into uh, political divides. And I'll, I'll give you one anecdote about why fake news was so treacherous to work with is because when you would talk with designers at these social or technologists at these social media companies, they would just say, well, you know, fake news, real news, like what's the difference? It's information you know, and, and, um, and they didn't understand what we were actually talking about, which is to say that they were using these popular definitions and Trump had ob obviously made an enemy out of the New York Times and CNN by then saying they were fake news. But what we were actually talking about was something that Craig Silverman had had looked into when he was, I think, a Neiman fellow, where there was where these cheap knockoff websites that were made to look like news uh, but we're really just about clickbait and they'd come up with any old headline that would make you uh, want to click through the content. So, so fake news for us was a technological problem brought about by the monetization of advertising uh, where you had these, these fake websites. Uh, but then the politicization of that term made it seem like, well, when you're talking about fake news, you're talking about, um, you know, a political category. And so when disinformation started to sort of become something you could talk about and not have it be necessarily only aligned with discussions of Russia, it felt like a better fit than dealing with um, particularly uh, the fake news discourse. But then on top of that, uh, uh, you know, when networked propaganda came out, of course, propaganda got put back on the map in a serious way uh, to look at, you know, the phenomenon of media elites uh, who were using uh, both the online and the broadcast environment in order to uh, create a, a zone of information that was um, politically uh, motivated. And so for me, when I think about propaganda, I'm thinking specifically about, you know, the way in which that book positions network propaganda as a, as a kind of tool of media elites. But with disinformation, for us as a research team, we're really trying to look at the incentivization. And we deal a lot with fringe groups. We don't necessarily, um, of course, we're avid, avid watchers of Tucker Carlson, but insofar as he's like the shit filter, which is that if things make it as far as Tucker Carlson, uh, then they probably have, um, you know, much more uh, f like stuff that we can look at online. And so sometimes he'll start talking about something and we don't really understand where it came from. And then when we go back online, we can find that there's 
uh, quite a bit of discourse about wouldn't it be funny if people believed this about Antifa or, you know, um, so yeah, so that's, I know it's not a clean answer, but that's sort of how we arrived at where we are. Awesome, thank you. So to, to follow with that, I think particularly as you start to talk about kind of the, the media and those distinctions, uh, the next question we have is, and um, I know this will be a more complicated answer, um, how have, many, have any social media companies expressed any willingness to work with groups like yours on squashing mis misinformation on their platforms? Um, and I guess I'm thinking about that particularly as, as you were describing kind of the, the fringe groups and how they're uh, taking advantage of and, and often the media companies are profiting from that, that advantage. Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll take meetings with anybody. We just won't take their money or data, right? And so the idea here is basically that you need to have a pretty, uh, for, for my team especially, we have a pretty strict rule about how we get our data, the way in which we engage with platform companies or any company. Um, we will take meetings literally with anyone, right? Because for us, it's not about it's not about them getting us to see it their way. It's about us getting them to see it our way, right? A education when done well is we all arrive at a shared definition of the problem. And so for us, engagements with different companies really are about showing them something they couldn't see because they were um, stuck in a specific mode of thinking. So for example, if we think about all of the different ways in which research could have been done about disinformation in the elections, um, I think the approach of uh, the Berkman Klein team around you know, looking at mail-in voter fraud very deeply using Media Cloud was the right approach. Uh, they didn't you know, go out and solicit a bunch of information and funding from platform companies that would mire them in questions of their allegiances and whatnot. They just did what they knew how to do. And they were able to, like many of us that remain fairly independent, were able to see that the question wasn't really about how many misinformation campaigns we were going to see, big or small. It was really about having the best knowledge we could have of the ones that were going to have what looked like the most amount of impact because they had a couple of signature um, aspects to them, which is that media elites were picking them up, political elites were, were pushing them, and they were forcing a public conversation that wouldn't have, have, wouldn't have happened if not for the design of our media ecosystem operating in this way. One of the things I don't think any of us could have predicted, though, was the reaction, for instance, of uh, large-scale media corporations like the New York Times or the Washington Post or even the Wall Street Journal not to pick up that political propaganda and parrot it back out, especially during the time of the, you know, dun-dun-dun, the Biden laptop story. Um, so I, I think that when we, as research teams, engage with uh, industry it's really, really crucially important, and I can't underscore this enough, to go with the method that you know and to go with the mode of analysis that is most authentic to uh, what it is that you're trying to study. So for us, it's mostly qualitative digital ethnography. Like we watch the content, we understand who the players are, we understand the scene, and we, and we take that pretty seriously. And so as a result, we don't get stuck in, you know, questions about, you know, oh, did this have any impact, or did this do that, or blah, 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 or like, you know, what we can show very cleanly is these are the progression of facts, uh, and we can show empirically how these things scaled, and then we can um, look at, you know, the kinds of reception and, and mitigation attempts that platform companies have had. And then we can evaluate them based on the ways in which uh, manipulators either choose to abandon that project or they uh, choose, you know, another route. 
And so that's, you know, that's different from other research houses that do very similar kinds of things. Um, and I think the other challenge journalists have is a very similar one, which is none of us want to get stuck in the role of becoming like an arm of the industry just doing content moderation. That's that's not what's an interesting piece of the puzzle for me. The interesting piece of the puzzle, and this is probably just because I'm a nerd, is like, how do we make sure that people can make accurate, you know, can access accurate information and make decisions about their lives based on that information? As well, like, I also want to have a little bit of fun. So I enjoy a good prank and I enjoy a good hoax. Uh, but I think that by and large, when we're dealing with this information, misinformation at scale, it's a feature of these industry practices. And therefore, um, we can't assume that the industry is going to be able to see itself for what it is. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Exactly what I was thinking. So this one, I think, ties well with that last one and is a good kind of uh, wrap up question from uh, Charmian White. Can you elaborate the concept of a distribution plan for the truth? How is it possible for social media companies to deliver timely and accurate information when communications on them are instantaneous in real time uh, and the number of contributors to these networks is ever expanding? It's a, it's, it's, it's a hard problem and needs more research. Um, and that's why um, I really value the work of, of librarians on thinking through these kinds of taxonomies. Uh, that we're going to need and the kinds of ways in which we might want to hold out certain categories. Um, I'm thinking here of Deirdre Mulligan's work on uh, rescripting search. She's got this beautiful paper about do we have a right to the truth? So what happens when you Google did the Holocaust happen? Right. So back when she was writing her paper, terrible things happened when you Google did the Holocaust happen. You were actually brought directly into uh, anti-Semitic groups who would, you know, post literally every single day anti, you know, Holocaust, anti-Semitic content. And this is an experience that I had as a researcher uh, looking at white supremacist use of DNA ancestry tests. It wasn't the case that when you were looking up certain kinds of white supremacist claims that you were given information about white supremacist groups and, and why they were bad. And the SPLC does a really good job of tracking that. It just wasn't rising to the top of Google. What was were, you know, white supremacist groups like Stormfront. And so for me, it was really important to think through those questions of, well, what do you get when you search for X? What do you get when you search for Y? And then how do those algorithms reinforce that? Um, Dana Boyd and I wrote about um, self-harm. And if you, for a while, if you were to look up how to injure yourself and you wouldn't just get, you know, tutorials, you would also be reminded that you searched for that over and over and over again on YouTube and Instagram and other places that didn't really have a great um, uh, restrictions on that kind of content. Uh, and this goes back to, you know, early discussions about Tumblr and, and pro-anorexia blogs. And so um, I think it now is the point to understand that we've reached a kind of critical mass with social media and dealing with information at scale is just profoundly different than dealing with rumors or hoaxes that kind of stay local. Because social media companies have focused for so many years on increasing scale, increasing information velocity, we now have to have a bunch of different professionals dealing with it in like really like slapdash kind of ways, right? The way in which journalists have had to take up the problem of media manipulation because they have been targeted by it, the way in which election officials have had to deal with it this year. It's just, it's beyond, um, it's beyond a, a, a kind of sh quick technological fix. We actually need a pretty robust program to, um, to deal with the curation problem so that when you do search for how to vote, <laughs> you get information about what's uh, particular to your area. Um, and it's only recently, like I cannot express to you enough how recent it is that these companies have been willing to make those changes. 
prior to that, it was like, if you asked me in 2016, if we were going to get any traction on dealing with these white supremacists that were organizing online, that were rallying at, at Trump rallies, meeting one another, growing their ranks, uh, you know, expanding their podcast networks, I would have said, no, absolutely not. These companies are completely unable to face what they have built because they didn't think about the negative use cases. They didn't think about how um, different people, fringe groups would rise to the top and have an incredibly outsized impact on our culture. The question of propaganda then comes into full view as Trump kind of, pardon the meme, but assumes his full form as the president who is trying to defend himself from a lost election. Uh, this has, you know, just kind of thrown everybody on their heels in this, in this field, trying to, to map and understand what the, what the real problem is. You know, I was talking with Jane Lechenko at Buzzfeed and she was just saying, I did 44 debunks in two weeks and I'm tired and maybe it's not working anymore. Maybe you can try to debunk everything, but it's just not, it's not going to hold, you know, the gates, the gates again are broken. And so um, we just, we need to have more thinking, of course, and like as a nerd and more research, but I do think the possibilities of solving this problem um, lie uh, between these different professional sectors. And that's why I think the multidisciplinary approach to this problem where we try to get everybody's uh, concerns on the table, we try to understand how to navigate that. And then, um, you know, with, with a little bit of uh, group from like, you know, with a little bit of help from groups like, uh, you know, Jonathan Zittrain's assembly project, we can start to have those deeper conversations that, um, ask the question, you know, how do we get beyond misinformation at scale and whose responsibility is it and how much is it going to cost and how do we, how do we end up with the, the internet that we want uh, rather than this like thing that we, you know, eventually like the thing that we have, which currently is, isn't working. Um, and the public health implications right now are, are really where my mind is at because ultimately um, this kind of misinformation at scale, uh, politicized uh, uh, medical misinformation, medical information around masks, around cures. Um, this is like, this is gory stuff because you know, we're going to look back on this moment historically, and every one of us is going to wonder, did I do enough? And how could I have done better? And um, that's why I think it implores us all to try uh, as much as we can to get involved, to think through these problems and to, and our method is thinking with case studies, because we want to think about things in depthly, and then we want to abstract from them uh, higher order definitions and principles. So that's where my mind's at. But I appreciate everybody tuning in. We're going to have uh, several misinformation trainings starting uh, every month, uh, starting in January. And we're going to have lots of opportunities for people to write for Casebook as well. So I'm really looking forward to that uh, as the next iteration of this project.